<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. So uh, we did the processing of Spanish dialectal variation by native Spanish speakers in Bogota, Colombia over the summer. And this is um, the view from our terrace, which is a place where we spend a lot of our time. This was the view of the city, but then you turn around and all you see is mountain. So it was very beautiful up there. So to provide some background for the experiment that we conducted in Colombia, one of the defining characteristics in some varieties of Spanish is aspiration. And basically what aspiration is, is the weakening of the word final S. So for example, um, if someone meant to say las puertas rojas, instead of pronouncing the S completely and fully realizing it, they would weaken it and instead pronounce la puerta roja. But in a non-aspirated variety of Spanish, participants would instead pronounce las puertas rojas. So in order to understand a language completely, you would need to be exposed to a lot of different varieties. Um, and native Spanish speakers can um, understand um, different dialects, however, um, they have some difficulty with this. And with aspiration, this provides ambiguity um, for masculine and feminine nouns. So, as Kelly just mentioned, um, there is a certain level of ambiguity when you consider the characteristic of aspiration. So, especially when you're considering feminine nouns, this really comes into play. Um, that this is because when you go from a singular feminine noun, such as una puerta roja, when that is aspirated, the aspirated version sounds a lot like that singular. So in order to illustrate this, I'm gonna show a couple of examples. The first one, um, hoping that the audio works, is just the fully realized S um, on the plural version. Unas puertas rojas. Now this next version is going to be the aspirated part of this um, plural object. Una puerta roja. Now I will play the singular version, and what you will hear is that that singular version sounds a lot like that plural aspirated version. Una puerta roja. So as you can see, as, as a listener, it's very hard to distinguish between that plural um, object when it's aspirated and the singular. However, with masculine nouns, we do not have this type of ambiguity because going from a singular to a plural, the vowel O is added to denote its plurality. So I'll show you an example with that. A singular uh, green eye would sound something like this. Un ojo verde. Fully realized in the plural, it would sound something like this. Unos ojos verdes. And then the aspirated version sounds like this. Uno ojo verde. So as that listener, once again, you hear, you distinctly hear that O, which denotes its plurality. <coughs> so in uh, previous literature that our study was based on, we found that uh, learning and or categorization of new unknown speakers was enhanced by exposure to multiple speakers of the same variety, and also when it was presented in the context of a sentence. And other research found that some sort of difficulty, term desirable difficulty, is needed to ensure that learning is maintained, which we'll explain more. So this is an example of a slide that participants would see when they were conducting our study. Um, they would see a screen that had four pictures and the pictures would all be different. And while looking at these pictures, they would hear a sentence. Juan vio una puerta roja. And with this sentence, they would then have to select the picture that they thought they heard mentioned in the sentence. So in this example, this was an aspirated sentence, and um, participants would have to select the picture with the two red doors. However, they would have to distinguish whether they thought they heard a singular red door or plural red doors due to the ambiguity of aspiration. So the main questions that we set out to um, explain through the course of our three experiments were how native speakers are best able to distinguish and comprehend these differences in a variety um, when considering the aspiration, especially in a, a setting where the participants that we were testing are not accustomed to hearing this type of aspiration on a daily basis because our participants were natives of Bogota. They don't, they don't tend to use aspiration, so this is kind of um, somewhat new input for them. And so what we really want to see is what kind of input facilitates learning. Is it consistent input or is it some kind of variability like David mentioned via desirable difficulty that really helps facilitate and, and help them maintain this learning in the long term? So the, <clears throat> the basis of our experiment was based on the participants first experiencing a learning block and in the learning block they experienced one of our three conditions that accustomed them to the experiment and the concept of aspiration. And then in the testing block 
um, all of the speakers would consistently aspirate and it was a means to see how well they picked up on the aspiration and whether or not they learned and to see how accurate they were in their learning. So going off of that, I think it's really important in order to distinguish between our three experiments to explain what each learning block was, um, what, con what it consisted of. So we examined the um, difference between a consistent and an inconsistent environment. Oops. So for my condition, my participants were presented with a single speaker who was inconsistent aspiration. So basically what this means is that this one speaker, half of the trials would aspirate or weaken that word final S, and then the other half of the trials, the speaker would fully realize the S at the end of the words. Um, and this was done in an unpredictable manner. And for my condition, the it was multiple speakers consistent, and that means the one speaker would consistently aspirate and the other speaker would consistently not aspirate, and there was no mixing between the two. So over time, they could condition it to each speaker. And in my condition, I had two speakers that would inconsistently aspirate. So for half the trials, like Maggie Rose's, they would consistently aspirate um, or consistently not aspirate. And so due to this, this was also done in an unpredictable manner. So that brings us to our results. Um, so this is for my condition, the single speaker inconsistent. And so we have a, a graph here, which plots the block on the X axis versus the accuracy on the Y. Um, and what this means is that we have the learning and testing blocks set up right next to each other. Um, and then we have the red bars denoting the feminine targets and then the blue bars denoting the masculine targets. Um, and what we can see here is that the masculine targets are at a very high accuracy, which is what we would expect because um, the masculine targets don't show any ambu ambiguity. Um, however, with the feminine red um, blocks here, there was no significant difference shown in this graph. So um, because of that, we're going to take a closer look into the testing block and what's going on within that. So again, this is another graph here that we have trial plotted on the X versus accuracy on the Y. And essentially what that means is how the accuracy um, of our participants was impacted over the course of the entire experiment, over all of the trials in the experiment. So we have the blue line, again, denoting the masculine targets. And again, that's at a, a very consistent high accuracy, which is, like I said, what we would expect. Um, however, with the red line, we see something a little bit different going on. We see that the line begins at a high accuracy. However, going forward on into the experiment, the participants start to fluctuate in accuracy. But then ultimately, by the end of the experiment, the participants increase back to a, a high level of accuracy. Um, and, and that fluctuation may suggest some sort of um, issue or um, going from the, the inconsistent input in the learning block to the consistent aspiration in the um, testing block and, and maybe that the participants start to second guess what they had learned in that learning block. So <clears throat> for the multiple speakers consistent condition, we see that the um, they're very similar to the learning and testing blocks are very similar to the findings in the single speaker inconsistent block and there was no con significant differences between the two. And then for the testing block though, we found something really interesting was that they started off at a very low accuracy, but they very quickly um, applied their learning from the consistent condition and then they remained fairly or very consistent within their answer choices. And in the results of my experiment, we found that there was no real difference between the learning and the testing block for the masculine nouns. However, for the feminine nouns, there was a significant decrease from the learning to the testing block, showing that for whatever reason, participants were getting confused or doubting themselves. And when further analyzing the testing block, we found, um, again, that there was a significant decrease in the feminine noun um, selectivity for the targets. And when analyzing all of the results together, we found that multiple speakers inconsistent was the condition that yielded a significantly lower accuracy when compared to the single speaker consistent, inconsistent or the multiple speakers consistent. So as Kelly just said, we found that the inconsistency among multiple speakers tends to hinder long-term learning of the cues of, in this case, which is aspiration. 
and the findings of the study serve as a baseline so that we can apply this to future studies to determine whether or not the desirable difficulties versus consistency. So in this case, we know that um, multiple speakers inconsistent hinders learning. So now it'd be very interesting to look at um, single speaker inconsistent versus multiple speaker consistent because we couldn't really find any significant differences between the two. And um, if we were to do this again, we'd probably use eye tracking or something to figure out if there was any like distinct differences between the two. And the ultimate goal of this experiment would be to figure out the best way to, although this was done with native speakers, the ultimate goal was to figure out whether or not we could teach L2 learners the best way to pick up on all these different phonemic variations within a language, within their second language, and in this case, which was Spanish, which has such a wide variety. Um, and then we just wanted to kind of wrap it up with a little bit about our experience. Um, most of our time was spent in Bogota, and we spent our time conducting our research at the Instituto Caricuervo, um, which was a, an amazing place to spend a lot of our time. Um, this is a view right outside of my testing room, and then right downstairs, Kelly and David had their own rooms with a, a great coffee pot right in the middle where we would often convene to talk about our days. Um, this on the left is a picture of the view outside of our kitchen window. So although we didn't cook much, um, it, was, it was still a wonderful sight to look at. And then um, these three ladies here were also worked at the Institute and really just helped us feel so welcome in the new environment and invited us on their Friday lunch dates, which, which was also very nice. Um, we also traveled to Palenque with Dr. Lipsky's students, which was another really um, enriching experience. Um, and we didn't collect any data there, but we were just there to really immerse ourselves in, in, and gain that experience. And then we also made friends with the baristas that worked in the cafe below our Airbnb. So that was, they were some of our best friends there. <laughs> and yeah, so we got, to, we got to see a lot of Colombia as well. We went to Medellin and it was, it was a wonderful time. And then finally, we